Our final panel, our final session of this convention is called Journeys Out of Controlling Religious Communities. A little bit of information there, a little bit of background. So part of our mission at American Atheists is to educate people about atheism. And one important way that we do that is by sharing stories from our community. Who are atheists? I know that's a, not a bizarre question for many of you because you are atheists and you know your own story and those, the story of those around you. But a lot of people don't. And there are a lot of different stories in our community that we don't always get to hear about. What kinds of experience do atheists have? What kinds of challenges do some members of our community face? What are some of the harms related to religion that we face? Some of these which motivate us to be more involved with the secular community and to be activists. Because of the harms we face, because of the experiences we have, what kinds of activism are we interested in doing? Who are we? And so one of the goals of the convention is to share some of the stories from our community that also highlight the diverse experiences and involvement that secular people have. We're pleased to be joined today by three amazing panelists who will share their experiences leaving religion. And then we'll have some discussion too about involvement with the secular community, some ways that we can do things better, and of course, take your questions. So we'll go through them. Um, I'll introduce them one at a time and have them talk about their background and experiences leaving high control religions. Our first panelist is Owen Morgan. He's run the Telltale YouTube channel and the Telltale podcast channel since 2016. They started both as purely atheist platforms, but over time he drew from his experiences as an ex-Jehovah's Witness to direct his research and content more towards cults. Now he focuses his video and podcast on destructive cults, including Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, Mormonism, Scientology, and others. So I'm pleased to have joining us today, Owen Morgan. Thank you for having me. Am I audible? Can, can you guys see me and everything? Awesome. Okay. So I figured I would start by just telling you guys who I am and how I got my start and how I escaped religion in the first place and how I entered religion in the first place. Uh, when my parents were in their 20s, uh, they were in the Air Force together. That's where they met originally. And they, there was, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a very rocky relationship to start. They got married and eventually they got divorced. And they had two kids uh, in this whole time period my older brother and my older sister. Eventually, some Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on my mom's door after they got divorced from each other. And she started studying the Bible with them, as they say. Um, a little bit of time passed, and eventually my dad tried to get back with my mom, tried to remarry her. And she said to him, these are her words. Like she told me that this is what she said. She told him, either you can join Jehovah's Witnesses with me, and we'll get remarried, or you will never see the kids again. She gave him that ultimatum. So, of course, you know, having no other options, my dad joined Jehovah's Witnesses, got remarried, and then had my older brother and me. From that moment on, our lives were completely immersed in the religion. I mean, every aspect of our lives revolved around Jehovah's Witnesses. The nature of a cult is one where every aspect of your life somehow links back to the religion. And that's what it was from year one to 18. 18 years later, I started realizing that things weren't really quite right with me, with life, with this religion. Um, I was isolated for a good portion of my teenage years because you're not supposed to have outsider friends. So I started, you know, trying to get these experiences that I couldn't get otherwise, experiences that I wasn't allowed to have as a young Jehovah's Witness. 
I got a girlfriend when I went to high school. I went to a couple of high school parties. You know, I smoke a I smoked a cigarette. I drank a little bit of alcohol. Bad decisions, but in retrospect, I was acting out, trying to get these experiences that I couldn't have access to otherwise, that I had never had access to, trying to find some way to escape the religion. So 18 years old, on my 18th birthday, in fact, the elders found out what I was doing with, you know, a worldly girlfriend and everything. And I got this fellowship. My mom kicked me out of the house. 18th birthday is when I was kicked out of the house. Had nowhere to go. I called this girl I knew from high school and asked her if I could stay with her. And she said yes. So I ended up going to her house, but her grandparents didn't know. So I climbed in the window of her bedroom and lived in her bedroom for three weeks without anybody else in the house knowing. I mean, an experience like that might seem pretty straightforward, but you don't really know what's involved in doing something like that until you actually have to do it. Like I had to plan when I was going to use the bathroom. I was, I was using the bathroom only at night when everyone was asleep. I was peeing in cups. I was sitting in her room and she would bring dinner back to her bedroom so that we could share it. Those types of experiences are what comes from extreme religious indoctrination in the United States. That's what comes from shunning. I mean, that's what religion has had to offer to everybody that I know. So over time, I, I, I was 18 years old when that happened. Over the course of the next few years, I still believed it. Uh, eventually, I, I think maybe 21, 22 years old, I was talking to my now ex-brother-in-law, my sister's ex-husband, who was still in the religion, but he allowed himself to talk to me. He and my sister both talked to me while they were in the religion, kind of breaking a rule. But they kept their mouths shut about it because I guess they just kind of disagreed with that part of it. So I'm talking to him one day and he says to me, you know that uh, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the religion, or I'm sorry, not Charles Taze Russell, uh, Joseph Rutherford, the second president of the religion, he said, you know, uh, Joseph Rutherford, the second president of the religion, had a mansion built for himself during the Great Depression and deeded it to Bible characters like Abraham and Isaac and the others. And I don't know what it was about that story that just like, like set off a light in my head that just made me realize they are so full of it. Like everything about this religion is BS. Growing up, this religion drilled into my head how completely ridiculous every other religion was out there. They would present arguments against Mormonism and Pentecostals and Catholics and every other religion. They wanted to make it clear that they're part of Christendom and they're full of it and there's no reason to believe it. But that moment with him, with my ex-brother-in-law, was the moment it took for me to realize that Jehovah's Witnesses were full of it too. So after stewing on that for a little while, I started to uh, watch some atheist content on YouTube. Um, this is before it kind of turned toxic. And over time, I just kind of decided it was time for me to start doing my own atheist YouTube channel. And I haven't had any regrets ever since, though I have lost my family. I've lost my childhood friends and I've lost a whole lot more than that. I am intellectually honest and I am a more moral person now than I was then. And for that reason, I couldn't possibly be happier with the way my life has gone. 
and I've set my life goals to be uh, trying to help people out of the same situation that I was in when I was younger. Right now, at this moment, I I'm on the East Coast, so it's 1.12 p.m. At this moment, somewhere, a Jehovah's Witness just left his house after having lunch with his family and hugged and kissed his wife and his kids goodbye so he could go back to work. And he got in his car and he buckled his seatbelt and said to himself, I don't believe any of this and I can't tell anybody or I will lose the family that I just said goodbye to. That has always been my motivation for covering this subject. And I will continue to cover it until I can't speak anymore. Anyway, that's my story. Um, for those of you who may know who I am, you may be aware of what's happening now with me. Um, you know, my daughter recorded some stuff in her health class, some disparaging stuff about the LGBT community. One of her teachers used her public platform as a public school teacher to disparage the LGBT community and to disparage atheists, say they have no morals or, and values, things like that. And the entire town turned against us uh, in a very violent, direct way. Uh, so that's something I'm dealing with. But like I said, I don't regret a thing. I don't regret any of it. I, I can lay down and go to sleep at night and sleep well, knowing that I have done the right thing. So anyway, that's my presentation. That's my story. I hope you guys liked it. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say like is the word when there's so much trauma involved in that. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to help other people who have had similar experiences. Actually, in the background, you can see I, I have a game collection, but the shelves are completely empty because I, I had to move out of this little town uh, because of everything that happened. But you know what? Like I said, I'm happy with who I am and the decisions that I've made. We will all make it through. You know, we, we have all dealt with trauma. There is a best selling novel in everybody's life story. And, uh, you know, all we have to do is tell it to show support for other people in similar situations. I guess before we go on to uh, J Rod, considering the recent developments, can you give a little more information about that? Sure. Um, well, my my daughter's health teacher, I got basically a I got like a 14 minute recording of her total. I only re released like the three minute clip in the middle because that was a really important part. But she basically said um, she used her public platform to say that she doesn't agree with gay marriage. She doesn't agree with men dressing as women or women dressing as men. Obvious just disgusting stuff that she was saying. Um, so I got it on recording, sent it to an organization with lawyers that can actually fight this, um, much like American atheists. And uh, yeah, the town basically turned against me. They created a Facebook page. I mean, the town's only 3,500 people and 1,800 of those people joined a Facebook page dedicated to doxing me, sending around pictures of my house and saying they were going to burn it down and saying they were going to kidnap my daughter. I mean, direct threats against me. It's really scary shit, seriously. But uh, Kylie is safe and I'm moving out of here soon in the next week. Hopefully I'm going to be in the Northeast where I grew up grew up in Connecticut. I'm going back to that area. New York City is what I'm shooting for. So won't be too long. And how old is your daughter with this health class? 12. She's in sixth grade. Yeah, I I know it is not easy for her what she's going through right now. But the, the level of support from the community has been just astounding. That Facebook, I'm sorry, that Facebook group had 1800 people. 
she got 3,000 people following her on Twitter after everything happened. So, um, you know, she knows that the community is here for her. So that's great to hear. And yeah, I'd like to get into more conversation um, in the discussion portion about how the secular community has, or in some cases, maybe has not been there for people who have left yeah. difficult religious situations. Definitely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm. And we'll go on to uh, J. Rod Garrett, who I'm also really glad to have here. <laughs> I will read part of his bio. He describes himself as a man of many hats. Is he wearing one? Yes. <laughs> He's a poet, storyteller, and army veteran that volunteers as the youth coordinator for Northern Wasatch Oasis in Northern Utah. He's also a board member of the Oasis Network. J-Rod has worked in education and mentoring for more than 10 years. From teaching poetry to running open mics and even running role-playing games, he consistently teaches the value of each person having a voice and the need for that voice to be inclusive. So I'm glad to have him here, J-Rod Garrett. Good morning. Oh, uh, listening to one story is so good and so awful. Um, I come to being an. <laughs> it's interesting to find myself in the space of being an atheist, specifically because I, I think back to roughly five years ago, and I could, I would could not have dreamed in that time frame of my life being like this now. Um, a lot of my story has to do with my first marriage, actually. Um, in my, I got married around, I did pretty much everything the LDS religion you have to offer. So from, um, getting the priesthood which you may or may not have heard of to going on a mission where i t where um the best way of putting a, a mission is you literally go out and you colonize people to join your religion go colonization um from there i i went through i came back from my mission and i got married um now i got married to a a wonderful a wonderful young lady who i am still friends with to this day um but the problem about all that was is i kept asking for folks in the church to support us in terms of being in there for us in terms of community and over and over and over we i got um messages of no from I went on my I got married to my wife one month before I went out to Iraq um, for my first deployment and said hey would someone just come in and walk look in on her once or like once in a while there is no one who came from that that group to come check on her I left on more than one I left on more than one um, mission that I asked for folks to come in and check on my wife. No one ever checked up on her. No one ever checked in. In fact, no one ever checked in until um, she was going through a crisis, crisis of faith herself, starting in around 2008 with what the church did concerning the LGBTQ movement. Um, telling them that, like, being against gay marriage. And I remember listening to a lot of that and being like, I don't agree with, like, what the church is doing here, but it's not that bad. Yeah, not that bad. That continued to um, give her doubts, and she moved more and more away from the church as time went on. Till I think in about 2013 is when she left. Um, the interesting thing, though, is I I was hearing some similar things to what she was hearing, and I I just I just kind of pushed it aside. It's like 
my faith is strong enough to deal with all the things I'm hearing. And when I didn't think it was, I asked her to not share something with me. Because, quite frankly, I, I don't know if this resonates for anyone, I was afraid of losing a relationship with God. That, that was my big thing about staying in the Mormon faith. Because the problem is in relig religions that have a lot of control is they they teach this way of it's our way or the highway. So therefore, you're looking there like, we don't like, well, we have the priesthood. That's God's power on earth. Therefore, the Catholics aren't don't have it right. The Hindus don't have it right. The Muslims don't have it right. No other church has the fullness of God's gospel. So therefore, if you leave said organization, how do you go find another organization or church that you can fully invest in? It's not possible because the things that they've given you from the beginning lead only one place. Literally every person I knew who had left the church had ended up becoming an atheist. And I was terrified of that happening to me. Now, no, this does not mean that I had any bad experiences with anyone who was atheist. Every single atheist I knew, I, I've known in my life, at least closely, to that point were better human beings than I was. By far, they were less judgmental. They were more open. They were more caring. They were just fantastic human beings. It was awesome, and um, and I and I strive and I as I met more of them, I strive to be more that way in the way that I lived and I loved. The horrible part about all that was. I, that didn't really, I, I couldn't do that inside um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. What the Mormons have declared themselves officially as, and the, they say it's a bad thing to call us Mormon now. Ooh. The problem, the thing that came out that turned me away from the church finally, and my, my story is unique for this reason. When I left the LDS church, I still 100% believed in it. Absolutely. I remember uh, there was a talk, which is a speech that was given by a church leader, um, given in Chile by Elder Bednar, David Bednar, in 2015, where he spoke specifically about the church in term and homosexuality. And he had the audacity to say, there are no homosexuals in the church. I literally heard those words and was like, I am no longer Mormon. I am no longer LDS, not possible. I had read up on all of the church things concerning blacks and the priesthood. I had read all the things concerning all the mistakes they had made with that, with that, with black folks, like, and come to place like, okay, you made mistakes. You can figure out how to do this right. You can figure out how to make peace with people, except now they were following the exact same things. They learned nothing from anything. So. I had a very quick transitionary period where I went from being fully vested in the LDS faith to being completely out. I, w I went from being in the church to out of the church in about a month and a half. And for most folks I knew who had gone, gone on journeys of leaving the church, their journeys from the time that they were like, I don't believe this anymore. So the time they had like done the things to like let go of their temple covenants, so it's typically anywhere between 
two to four years. I took two days. My official, my official, uh, I was officially out of the church less than two months after I'd heard that. And so I went looking for some other, some other way to practice faith because faith is not about a church. It is not about a religion. It is not about any of those things. Faith is about being able to reach for something that isn't tangible. And I wanted to know what I wanted to spend my life focusing my faith on. Because leaving the church didn't make me any less spiritual. But it did do a lot of things for what my spirituality would become. For example, I, in the church, being black, there might be problems with a lot of things in, like, literally all of black culture that the church doesn't agree with. Like, rap music. They they don't agree with, like, um, exploring your sexuality. They don't agree with... Um, cussing or the more intimate things of black culture which is simply breathing because you know if you come into the church and you're black the first thing that happens is that you get assimilated into everything that is the church and the church is cream cream colored so you're a speck of pepper in a sea of cream you're you're not going to have yourself very long at all So leaving the, leaving the sea of cream was difficult and I had to figure out what parts of me were actually were me and what parts of me were them which um has been a very difficult process to go through I left them and went with the UU the Unitarian Universalist for a while because I like Religion's a beautiful thing. I still have that a belief. It does wonderful things for some people. I wanted to see what this organization would do for me. And I was really into it up until, um, and I'd like gone through and I was like, someone who was helping with services felt really good about that. We had a tradition in the group that I belong to of each Sunday, we would say the names of all those people who had been harmed by police brutality, which some people thought was offensive to the police. And other people were like, this is really deeply spiritual. It means that I have to think about what, what cost the police have in our society when we allow them to act lawlessly. I was very invested in like the way the values that I had and all of that until one Sunday they asked me to get up and I was the one who presented to the congregation that we were doing away with that tradition of having to feel and having to um actually think about what was going on with police brutality and they instead instituted they would take one Sunday a month and they would donate it to a random civil rights cause in the nation. Now, if you're not familiar with um, um, how problem solving is done in different communities, allow me to give you an, an understanding here. In black communities, you, you solve things inside your family. You have to feel things out. You have to actually grapple with your emotions. This does not matter. Um, this does not matter if you are on top of the hierarchy or at the bottom of the hierarchy. You're gonna feel things. You're gonna have to do that work. Um, traditionally, in many spaces I've lived in, especially here in Utah, white folks tend to have a tendency to we don't have to actually deal with our emotions in this situation. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to throw money at it. 
And by throwing money at it, the problem goes away. I couldn't, after having shared that message, um, that I was not where I was going to share until that morning. <laughs> I decided that the UUs were not for me. And I left their congregation. I joined up with another group by the name of Oasis, which um, has been a very good thing for me. There's a secular organization. There's no real belief. There's no requirement to believe in God or not believe in God. People can come and go as they please. It's the, the idea of it is it's a space that allows people to focus on their own humanity first. And as such, I've like I've done a lot with them. Like I I actually do childcare in for Oasis. The kids and I played Dungeons and Dragons together, based off the values in there. We've talked about um, racism. We've talked about sexism. We've talked about um, homophobia in in those spaces, and the kids really enjoy that. We're able to actually dig into the meaningful things about what it means to be human in a space where everyone's pretending they're not human, really. But it's been it's been fascinating. Yeah, that's, a, I guess, a little bit of my story. Um, but as I'm a poet as well, I wanted to share with you a poem that I wrote. Um, it's National Poetry Month this month, Poetry Writing Month this month. And I wrote this about two years ago about um, this was about the time when I think shortly after I realized I, I had become an atheist, that I no longer had a belief in God because I couldn't, because no, I could no longer think of God as this all good being that cared about me or cared about anyone. And no, that was the guy who like, while I was in by either the LDS faith or being a UU, I did not ever have a prayer go unanswered. Although I watched a lot of other people have that experience where they like, God's not answering my prayers. Why is God not answering my prayers? the common answer was, you don't believe hard enough. You should believe harder, or you should become more righteous, or you should do more to show God that you are a person worthy of having prayers answered. This would be told to someone who was doing everything in they could possibly do in their life to be a good person. And literally, if the best of any of us isn't good enough for God, that is not a God worth worshiping. So I, sh I want to share this poem with you as a, um, before another person comes on. Um, it's called The Dismantling of Faith. I wrote it April 12th of 2019. So little depends upon the architecture of heavenly bodies, though we express gratitude as if we all we receive comes from them. We are quick to say, thank God, when it was Timmy who broke bread with us. Timmy, who shouldn't have shared, we tell him that he'll be blessed by God for his kindness. Somehow escaping the need to show gratitude in action and leaving only empty words behind. Perhaps I would have less to say if, the script, if we lived what the scriptures say, to love our neighbor as ourself, and that we would recognize God as our neighbor, which means we would praise Timmy and offer him what we would to God, which, would, which then, if all we offer are empty platitudes, we love Timmy as much as we love God, which is to say, we love neither, nor ourselves, for the love we offer is, a, is of words, not action, and is an empty vessel. Whether you believe or not, there is truth in the words, faith without works is dead, because faith cannot be separated from belief. 
You cannot believe something and not live something. As such, love without works is dead. Hope without works is dead. Without work, there is no reason to believe what is said. It becomes the platitude of polite. The reason we end up far away from each other and unable to connect. So thank you. Thank you for breathing. Thank you for feeding your children. Thank you for going to work. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for holding my hand. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for being human. So much depends on human hands. Let's start acting like it. And with our deeds, we'll worship and our words will make certain people know their value in this world. Because heaven knows God is not telling us. Thank you. <laughs> You're not going to make me cry. I'm sitting here. That, that, that is a common reaction by poetry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Different kinds of tears, maybe. No. Thank you for sharing that, J-Rod. More questions, but I want to. I have questions, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions from the audience members too. So, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A tab so we can make sure to see them. Um, and we'll start addressing some of those after our third panelist. That was beautiful. I'm happy to have our third panelist here today with us too, Hiba, who I've known. Oh, it's been years now. Hiba Krisht is originally from Beirut. She's a writer, ed editor, and translator, and she's also taught logic, ethics, and political science in American and Lebanese universities. Hiba is a volunteer activist too with the ex-Muslims of North America, and she's given talks all over the country on Islam, Middle Eastern politics, and women's rights. So thank you for joining us, Hiba. Oh, there I am, hi. Um, hi, so I am Hiba, and I am going to be talking about my experience leaving a super insular and controlling uh, Muslim community. Um, so I'm ex-Muslim. I am an American, but um, I had that kind of like uh, third culture kid expat experience where I grew up mostly outside the U.S. Um, so I was born in the States, but my parents are both... Um, Lebanese and they basically took us back to the Middle East like as soon as they could. Um, I also grew up in one of those uh, conservative Muslim communities that puts a huge, huge emphasis on uh, modesty culture. So I was one of those kids that was put in a hijab, you know, when I was a kid. Uh, I was eight years old when my parents, like, according to the jurisprudence of my sect, that it was, like, mandatory. It was, like, obligatory. It was, it was uh, what we call wajib, a religious duty for girls um, the years uh, eight and older to basically nine lunar years, so, like, eight and a half solar years, to basically cover everything, everything in front of people, in front of men who aren't from your family, um, except for the hands and face. Um, so basically from when before I was like a, from when I was like a prepubescent child before, uh, you know, before I even had these concepts that were behind the, the modesty doctrine, I was forced to cover up basically everything. I stopped being able to like ride my bike because like that's immodest. Like you don't want people like staring at your thighs or whatever while you're riding a bike. I stopped being able to basically do most of the things that I had been able to do up until that point because like I was considered, even though I was still a child, a baby, I was considered grown in a way that my very body, my very existence was considered an, an, a sinful attraction to men that I had a personal responsibility to myself and to God to cover up. I think that talking about modesty, um, talking about hijab, talking about this brand, and I know that there are parallels like to Christian purity do doctrine, but like this particular brand of um, 
of like female based modesty is a really, really fraught issue because there is also the intersection of discrimination and racism that a lot of people, a lot of Arabs, a lot of uh, South Asians, a lot of people from Muslim communities face. And a lot of it ends up being disproportionately like attacking the hijab. Like, you know, we just saw like like yesterday or the day before that France basically is, uh, is making it illegal for people under the age of 18 to wear hijab in public, which is just so counterproductive because it doesn't do anything to protect the little girls that are forced into it because then they're just going to be kept home. Um, and this is the problem with um, insular communities of the communities of our sort that the rules are so rigid and they apply to every aspect of your life. I think what Owen said about his experience with Jehovah's Witnesses really tracks in that in the same way with us, that like there are rulings for basically every single aspect of your existence that you can imagine. The type of clothing that you can wear, the type of food that you can eat, the where you can look, the genders of the people that are allowed to be in the room with you and just things like, like the minutest little details. And it's super, super strange. It's super controlling. There are no boundaries. There's no privacy. There's no, um, there's no like tempering force there, and there's no room to breathe, especially because everything, in terms of like your flourishing, your prosperity, your upward mobility in the world, hinges on your compliance to these, uh, to these basically these these tenets, these precepts. And, um, and and it would be one thing if you'd be like, oh, well, if you don't like it, you can leave. It like, you know, like highway or the highway, but what was what is even worse and what makes it so much harder for us, especially for women from such insular Muslim communities, is that you are not really allowed to leave. Like you can try to leave. I tried many, many times. Um, and it's just like not something that you're allowed to do. You can you can have your reputation ruined and you can ruin all of your like prospects not that you have very many prospects in a community like that but you still won't be able to allow to be allowed to leave even if that is the case so in my case like i was in lebanon and um i did was I did my undergrad there, I did my grad school there, and every single time that I thought that like, okay, I'm an adult, I'm still living with my family because women aren't allowed to leave home, they're not allowed to, you know, get a job, they're not allowed to do that kind of thing, they're not allowed to support themselves. Basically, you go from your father's house to your husband's house. And if your husband or your father lets you go to university and lets you have a job, that's one thing, but that's something that is that is like in the, in the jurisprudence, in the actual religious rulings, this is something that they have to give, they have the power to give you permission to do or to withhold from you and it's not even that you can like marry whoever you want either like there are rules as to how who you can marry marry like a muslim woman can't marry a non-muslim per person for instance and you can't marry someone without your father's permission so basically even if there was someone i wanted to marry like legally i couldn't go and elope or whatever as a way to get out of my father's house no it would have to go through him and he would have to sign off on it or else it would be no deal it's a really long story about how I got out, and I don't think that that's like the should be the focus um, here. But suffice to say, I it took a lot of planning, a lot of patience, and basically, I I think like many of us who step out from communities like this, I basically lost everything in the process. Like I had to leave my country, I had to leave my home, I basically had to leave everyone and everything. Uh, my entire family community shunned me, like there are very few family members who still speak to me and that has to happen like in secret, covert ways. Um, and then like, you know, my father disowned me, I mean, it's mutual, but like, whatever. Uh, he disowned me like immediately, like he pretends he never had a daughter named Hiba. Like, like if someone like says my name in front of him, it's like, it's like he, he doesn't say anything. Like, it's like, I never existed. I'm like erased, <sighs> which I think is just hilarious. Um, every single, I have like a thousand cousins cause I'm, I'm Arab. Um, but like every single person in my extended family, I have not heard from them since I left eight years ago. Um, I'm allowed to be financially independent for, and which is what I like, I prefer that. But this is the thing, for people who can't or won't or don't want that type of life, there isn't really any other alternative. 
Like, you either stay within the fold and you follow the rules and you, you know, and you wear what you're told and you speak when you're spoken to and you do all of this gendered service that's super, super menial, um, especially for women. Like, you know, your role is reduced to the housewife, you know, maid, cleaner, mom, whatever. Um, and there are no other options. Um, and it's the type of thing that was just like, it just felt like every single moment of my life, I was being controlled even if there was no one there like physically forcing me to do anything. Like there are these invisible mechanisms of control. Like um, it's a lot, I think I, I, I mentioned this in other talks, it's a lot like Foucault's panopticon. Like if you imagine there's like a, like you live in like this open air prison where there are like it's like imagine it's like a circle a stadium and there are like all these cells but the cells have like clear glass or something you can see into them and then there's like this huge ass tower in the middle and you don't know who is watching in the tower you don't know what they're observing and why you just know that at any moment at any given second of any given day you might be you are being watched, you can be, you are probably being watched. And so you have to basically comply or else risk facing the consequences. So because I was unable to leave and because it felt like, you know, the eyes literally have walls and anything and everything that I did, like Lebanon is a super, super small country. Like everyone knows everyone. And it's, and it's super like divided along provincial lines. Like every province has like its own sect and it has its own like rules, like literally different laws apply to you based on the religion of your birth. It's not something you can move away from. Um, even like converting is a super, super tedious, hard thing to do and there's a lot of cronyism and corruption that prevents that basically bureaucratically prevents it from happening whenever it's not in the interest of a certain community so when i tried to run away like when i was 18 the first time uh basically a militant islamist group in my country hunted me down brought me home like that i mean it, it's like that like there are just no options and you're being watched all the time so even though like in my head and my heart i left the faith because I just, it, it, I couldn't reconcile it with like my reason, with my empathy, with, with everything that I thought and knew and believed about the world. It, 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 it was still something that I had to perform outwardly because I just didn't have any other choice. The consequences of not complying were too severe. Um, you know, anything from violence to imprisonment I have suffered for basically not fasting, not praying. So I learned to comply. I learned to basically go through the motions and it's a lot and there are a lot of rules and there are a lot of requirements and there are a lot of regulations. So like I will for I don't even know how many years because it kind of like all blends into your head eventually when you're just living this this reality. Like I can't remember exactly what year in my heart and my head I became an atheist because for so much longer I was still going through the motions. I was doing all the prayers and all the fasting and just, you know, and, and being and embodying the type of persona that my parents expected me to embody in order to safely, you know, in order not to risk my my physical safety. Like it felt like everything else was threatened. My, my psychological safety, I didn't want to exist for so much of the time because I felt like my existence was just unbearable. I wasn't allowed to do anything or go anywhere. The, the, the super controlling nature of, of, of being a woman and the type of possessiveness, the, 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 the impact on your family and the family honor. And, uh, and I know that it sounds like a buzzword, honor crimes and honor violence and honor culture, but it really is what it is like. Honor is like an actual currency where we are from in our in these communities that like if your family doesn't have a good reputation, then you can't get married, you can't get a job, you can't like you can't do anything, you can't have any kind of standing in the community because so much of it basically relies on your family standing. And your family standing basically hinges on what's between your legs. So like to the extent that like even though the first time I ran away, you know, I was brought back and, and, you know, my father, the first thing that he did was 
interrogate me very violently and viciously over and over again because he didn't understand why I would want to leave unless I was doing something like like one of the first questions he asked me was like are you pregnant or are you a prostitute I was like an 18 year old virgin that wasn't even allowed to talk to boys like I'd never like like I wasn't allowed to like hold a boy's hand or whatever like I wasn't go like it, he but he couldn't like I didn't have a good enough reason for wanting to leave basically it was they, like it, it it's like this kind of culture this kind of idea that like as a woman as long as you have a roof over your head and you have and you are clothed and fed then you have nothing to complain about it doesn't matter what your life is is like it doesn't matter what it looks like um and so i knew that there was no way to leave the community by defying it and that i would basically have to con my way out so basically, you know, I complied and I complied and I complied as much as I could. Like I was outwardly so religious. And you know what that does to you in your head to live that type of like fractured double life, to be someone entirely different in your heart and your mind than basically how you are presenting yourself in every moment to the world. It really messes you up. It means that you're always looking over your shoulder. It means that you are always anxious and afraid and unable to trust anybody. It feels like you're always being watched. You struggle with your honesty. You struggle feeling with knowing who you are, what kind of person you are, what kind of life you want to lead, because it's all, it, it's, it's like, it's like there's something, it, it's like you're completely dissociated from from yourself and it creates this this like deep deep internal trauma that it takes years to unpack afterwards which is basically what i've been doing since i left is like just trying to pick my life up and, and trying to basically have some sort of existence that feels valuable that feels that feels like was all of this pain and all of this whatever worth it in the end and of course it doesn't help that like i'm queer and so like, I, I doubly didn't want the type of relationships and the type of life that I knew that I would have to have that, I, that would be imposed upon me if I was to have any type of relationships at all um, when, when I was in that community. And, and leaving was one of the hardest things that I ever did. Taking the hijab off was very, very hard. I had been wearing it for 15 years by the time that I left. And if you have gone every single day of your life since you were eight years old, never, stepping outside without having every inch of your body covered um it, it's okay um actually i think because we want to have some more time for q a and we've run a little late i think i'm gonna wrap up and then we can move on to questions but like uh just to finish that point um yeah so like moving away from that moving away from the, the deep misogyny and the homophobia and how that intersects with the controllingness and the insularity that was a very very big deal it was very challenging for me all right cool hit all the appropriate buttons damn guys <laughs> <laughs> It's good to see uh, some of the comments from other moderator or other panelists and the um, audience during your presentations too. One of the similarities that you all share is like in leaving high control religions, particularly considering where you were located, what kinds of religions they were, what your environment was like. It was like unmooring yourself from your family and your or becoming unmoored from your family and your community. And as you all explain in different ways from yourself, from the way that you understood yourself. And I know Owen and J-Rod, you talked a bit about the communities, the secular communities that you were able to plug into or the support that you've received. Um, I wanted to get a bit more into that, partly because we have members of the secular community here um, in the audience watching the panel, um, so maybe going back to, to Owen first, because a lot of, I guess, yeah. most of your community experience has been in the online atheist community, which you said before it got toxic, right. interestingly. But um, like when you left, when you stopped being Jehovah's Witness, which was some time ago now, so in the relative infancy of the online atheist community, like what did you find? How did you connect with people? What was it like? 
Well, when I was, I think it was probably the early 2010s. I'd say between 2013 and 2015, because I think 2015 is when it turned into just a huge mess. Um, that's I, I started using Twitter. I started following people on YouTube and getting involved in their communities, their online communities. Um, then it turned into a toxic mess. And then I came along and tried to create my own, you know, YouTube channel because they all went down just a really weird rabbit hole that had nothing to do with atheism anymore. And uh, at this point, I feel like uh, the online YouTube atheist community at this point is really decent. You know, we've got people like Mr. Atheist. I He's legit too legit to quit if you will i mean he's all about gay rights and 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 the whole nine yards he did not go the direction that the old atheist community went so uh on twitter uh you can find me and all of the others and we're active on there all the time so that's the community that i'm a part of now largely is the atheist twitter and youtube communities i think and you found like support uh, other people who shared your story i know that there are people who consider you um, an inspiration to them and they draw strength and support from the stories that you tell and the people that you're able to connect them with. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not just my story. A lot of people have similar stories. Twitter isn't a fantastic medium for that, but it's the best we've got. I don't really want to go over to Facebook personally because uh, I there are some really solid facebook atheist communities too but i haven't gone over to that side because you know facebook gets pretty toxic but twitter is a really good uh, area for that in my experience and i know a lot of people who've told me their stories through twitter and through youtube comments and stuff like that that's kind of where i hang out i gotta say it's encouraging to hear positive remarks about community on twitter and youtube so <laughs> thanks oh for oh i know yeah no <laughs> don't get me wrong twitter can be a toxic mess but you got to find your own little niche in there and Thank the atheist space. community on twitter has been really really good in my experience so that's great to hear and j rod you plugged into um a uu church and the oasis community but also <laughs> utah's not that diverse a place. <laughs> and i looked up your account and i was like what are there like three black people i don't know <laughs> it's you know like Surely there are a lot of Mormons and ex-Mormons, um, which so you connect with people with experiences in that regard. But you know, have you found places where there's been difficulty finding peer support or with people who share parts of your experience that you're interested in sharing? What's it been like? Uh, you know, it it is a it was a struggle. Like the big the biggest struggle for me coming out of the church was um, engaging with my black hood. Like everyone around me was white. Like in being in Utah and being in the church, most importantly to understand is um, black folks didn't like me because I was Mormon and Mormon folks really didn't like me because, because I was black unless I assimilated into white culture, which I did and it was awful. Um, having come out of that and just, I don't find a lot of people are in the space of like, they really hate me or they're like against what I am or anything like that anymore, simply because like, as I mentioned earlier, um, I moved from trying to find a faith that the LDS faith to trying to find a faith that fits me. And my faith that fits me is I believe in people, everyone, even even the even the Donald Trumps of the world. Even though I'm absolutely aware they will always fail me, I know those people will fail me. I know that, but by believing in people, I find that it's a much messier way to believe. But I also find I can accept people where they are. Like this is where you are. This is who you are. That's fine. I can work with all that and I'm going to accept you and I'm going to love the hell out of you. Literal. If there's anything that's awful about you, I'm just going to love you until it's gone because we, 
Life is way too short for us to spend time here hating people. Do you feel like you've had to do a lot of work uh, or that you're continually engaged in a process of work, maybe, let's say that way, um, with the Oasis, with the outreach, with the efforts to uh -oh. make sure it's an inclusive community or that there's understanding or, you know, yes. when you talk about different issues or activism that you could be involved in, considering some of the tales you told of your experience in the church, the, the reactions of people to, you know, reading the names of people affected by police violence, for example. Do you see that in Oasis? Um, I, and, and Oasis, um, because it's a new organization and like, they're like, they're hitting their fifth year right now. Like, um, one of the reasons I joined with them is because it allows me to affect a lot of change. I'm on the national board. It allows me to have a voice on matters inside the organization because I knew if I didn't get involved, this would end up just being another white organization like so many are. Like, I love the UUs, but like the UUs will uh, will definitely tell you one of their biggest problems is that they're all white folks. <laughs> and they say they want to um, know more and do more, but that doesn't always translate over into knowing and doing more. It becomes those empty platitudes. Like, we want to do more. We want to know more. Tell us what we can do and then when you you tell them what they can do someone else in the community says that's disrespectful to x when it's not really disrespectful it's a matter of it means that the the power that that organization or person had will be diminished in their eyes and you play this game of power pie which means the person over here who has power over people you want to make certain they keep having power over people instead of being like I'm here to encourage people. I'm here to um, empower people. I'm here to cooperate with people. I'm here to have confidence in me. All the things that like remove us from a space of like having to fight with, having to fight for my blackness or my, um, any parts of my identity being valid. Yeah. It sounds like <laughs> for those of us uh, involved in this community in different ways, there's always work to do um, to improve the space for ourselves and others, right? To build a more inclusive, well-functioning community that serves more people better. Um, and I think even though we acknowledge that there are parts that are toxic or could be better and we're all ignorant about different kinds of things in different ways because we care about people and we care about this community that we're trying to work to make things better and build space for ourselves and others. Hiba, <laughs> I was wiping tears again. Jeez, weepy on this uh, Sunday morning slash afternoon. Um, <laughs> you're involved with the ex-Muslims of North America and you've been... I don't, were you in a student group? I can't remember when I first met you. I no, um, maybe. I was, I think, for a while involved at the group at Indiana University, but I did not stay there very long. So how did you plug into the secular community? Were you, like, seeking another community? Were you seeking understanding? Were you, did you find oh. the ex-Muslims first? Uh, no, I, I was there for the inception. Um, so I came to the U.S. in 2012 and XMNA was founded in, um, I think it was the uh, 13, 14, somewhere around that time. So I, when I came to the U.S., I was like, I was like all like raring to go because I was able to li like at least try to live authentically for the first time in my life. So like, you know, I took off my hijab and I was finally for the first time in my life able to express my ideas and my true opinions about things. Um, so, yeah, there was this I was uh, the way that I left Lebanon was to go to grad school. I mean, I didn't need to. Uh, but it was like I basically chose a program that doesn't exist inside Lebanon and basically like did every, met all of my parents' requirements so that they would let me leave. So I was at a creative writing program in at the university, uh, at Indiana University Bloomington, and they had a local um, secular student alliance group at the time. 
Um, and I joined in that. And then through the kind of like online connectedness through the, those secular uh, student alliance groups, I was able to meet other people in other states and so on. And then in DC in like, uh, I think it was 2013, um, it was not the year of the Reason Rally. It was it was before that, I think. We were doing an ex-Muslim group and this was before XMNA was a thing. Like there was just a bunch of ex-Muslims that were meeting up at this like semi-private event uh, with Richard Dawkins. I forget who organized it or who hosted it, but that was where I met uh, the some of the founders of XMNA. Um, you know, now the president uh, is still Mohammed Sayyid. Sarah Haider is the executive director. I met them in DC at that time. And then kind of out of that, like some, like, you know, the online organizing started and then XMNA kind of like morphed out of that, like around that time. And then, and then like the year after they registered it as a, a nonprofit. And then we started opening chapters and spreading, you know, reaching out to ex-Muslims um, across the US and Canada. So now we have like chapters in all sorts of cities. Um, so XMNA right now is moving away from the community outreach and organizing, um, unfortunately, but you know, it's it's their, it's the board's decision. They, they know what type of activism they wanna focus on. So the groups that used to be affiliated with XMNA, the, the local chapters in each state are now becoming their independent thing. Like we're, there's like this transition that's going on right now. But up until this, po this point in time, we had been focusing a lot on helping uh, finding and helping and connecting ex-Muslims who feel su understandably feel super, super isolated and alone. Because even in Muslim communities in the US and in Canada, there's still the type of insularity in there where you feel like you have to leave and you have to escape and you have to lose everything. It might not be as hard to leave as it was for me, but you would still have to lose everything in order for you to um, come out and to live authentically. And some people opt not to do that. They opt to stay within their communities and live a closeted life. It's easier for some than, than others, especially men, because they're given more freedoms and opportunities in general. Um, but we were able, because there's this like the sense among all of us that leaving is so unthinkable that we don't, it doesn't even occur to us that there may be others out there. So the fact that we were even able to create these types of, uh, local chapters and then we started having you know one larger annual meetup in dc every year that where everyone from all the chapters in, in canada and the us would come and we would just like hang out and and just we would connect with each other on this like really really intimate level that that because these are people with experiences that no one else has and no one else really understands um so yeah and so that's uh, and we we did this awesome tour uh, a few years ago i can't remember if it was 17 or, or 16 but we did uh like a bunch of tours of us and canadian universities where we gave a bunch of talks and that was uh, it was called the um what was it called the descent something freedom descent something uh, something like that tour um so there have been like a lot of like initiatives like that that we've done and then now that the state chapters uh have been functioning on their own. Like we have, like before COVID, we had monthly meetups and and so on. We have an extensive vetting process. Now that they've been functioning on their own for so long, it seems that it's uh, it's possible to transition to those running autonomously while XMNA goes and focuses on uh, uh, on different strategies like lobbying and advertising and so on. Yeah. Cool. I know we've talked before too at conferences and things about some of the extreme challenges that people face and um, some issues in the community too. <sighs> it's uh, difficult to do better. And I also know that we're supposed to be wrapping up our panel now. There've been a lot of questions. You were able to tackle some of them with your previous responses, but I guess uh, maybe a final question with some thoughts. Um, which is like the, where do we go from here and what can we do better question, but like, where do we go from here? Where do you see maybe on a personal level and at a community level, what's the future look like? What do you think is going to be coming up? What might be different? What do you want to see more of? Who wants to go first? Any, anybody <laughs> specific? You talked first, so it's you. Go okay, I'll go. go ahead, Owen. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, well, 
I come from the social media side, not really so much the mainstream side. Uh, they're a little bit different from each other. So in my experience, um, I've watched the algorithm of YouTube and of Twitter and of every other different type of social media platform push people forward. You're always growing and getting bigger. I mean, everybody, even if it's at a, a slow pace, even if it's at a fast pace, we're always growing. We're always bringing new eyeballs to the cause. So in my opinion, I think that the best thing that we can do to move the movement forward, if you will, is start YouTube channels and start Twitter accounts and be dedicated to taking part in social media to the best of your ability. Get out there and talk. We need eyeballs. We need people talking about this stuff. We need people involved. Um, I think that that's where we should go from the social media side. And I think where American Atheists is going from more the mainstream side is a fantastic direction. Newsletters and, you know, activist groups and all of the other stuff, all this stuff combined. We need more people involved um, to the extent that they can be. That's that's my take on it. It's certainly true that, you know, on social media, you get to communicate and touch and reach more people, different people um, than you would in some other channels. That's true. Like people get exposed to these things because they see a, a share or a retweet or a video or just people being willing to be out. So that's a good point. But and you're really good at marketing, by the way. You're really you have a really yeah. deep understanding of uh, the digital landscape. We should connect. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's bring let's bring the social media and the mainstream sides together. Let's do happy it. happy marriage. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna do that. <laughs> Let's connect. Thanks. And then, uh, J Rod, what do you think? What's what's the future look like? What what's going on? I see, I see in the chat there's this st statement about we need brains. Eyeballs are too passive. I want to build on that. Brains are too passive. We are not a thinking being. We are not thinking beings. We are feeling beings that think sometimes. That's a Brene Brown quote, not mine. But very much, we need people who are engaged in this with their hearts, and like that the hardest part of this is the fact of just being in the space of present to see people as they are where they are and asking them what they need like someone may be in a religion like one of the ones we left and be very happy there and that's okay for them that is okay for them because they're happy but like we don't know if that's like all what's going on until we ask what they need. Do do you need to know? Do you need someone to help you out with like some childcare? Do you need someone to be like, um, just to be like a shoulder to cry on? Do you need someone to simply tell you that you are valuable and needed in the world? And if you, and just that, so many people go without the simple message of that you are vital to the world as it exists. Like, um, I think of like what work Owen does. And I'm like, that's not my cup of tea. But um, I'm sorry, that's incredibly important work for some people. If people do not hear that message, like where you were at, that was a cult. These are the systematic things you need to do to get out. Guess what? They are going to hurt. They're not going to have a life. We have to all be uh, on board in whatever way we can in, um, and measuring our, our own abilities best to say, I want to be there for my fellow human beings, regardless of the cost. Because at this point in time, I can say I've lost, I've lost everything and I came back from it and I'm better. And I'm better for it. I'm willing to pass along that gift. That kind of support is so important. We talk a lot about activism. <laughs> we, not just American atheists, that's not all we talk about, but we in the community talk a lot about it, um, activism and truth and untruth. Uh, we don't often focus on that 
emotional part of like what are the human needs that we all have and what kinds of different things do people need in our community? That's an excellent point. And Hiba, what do you think? Future? How are things going? Where might things go? What can we do? Uh, yeah, you know, honestly, this is a question I'm still struggling with myself because um, I have seen the um, support for ex-Muslims grow a lot throughout the past uh, almost decade now. Um, and there has been a lot that has that has helped us, but there are still so many problems. And there are problems that are, it seems that, that, that they are difficult to challenge through one type of approach, like through community building or through lobbying or through um, if funding or whatever, like the types of problems that the people in our community share. And I feel like these are the most pressing issues for us to focus on. Um, they can range from, you know, from, having to deal with your parents try to, trying to deport you to a gay deconversion camp in Kenya to, uh, you know, your parents kicking you out in the middle of winter with nothing but your pajamas and no shoes um, in Minneapolis or something. That's a fake city. That's this, that's not where this happened. Um, and then not having anywhere to go or whatever. Um, and and it, it just feels like no matter what way we try to approach it, like raising awareness and then creating um, community fund, funding and support and so on, there's just always too little time and energy to go around, especially because most of the people who do this do this on a volunteer basis and it's not their full-time job. We just don't have the resources. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what to do about this. And this is probably why I moved away, like regrettably, I moved away from the secular community and from organizing in general th throughout the past few years, because I also like I need to focus on my own life and, and my own like, you, you know, I have a super, super demanding job and, and it feels like everyone is in that same bo boat. And and every time that we have tried to engage with and, and tried to call attention to our issues and tried to, to make some kind of change, like I am really happy and, and grateful and privileged to be here, but I know that tomorrow, the broader state of the community is not going to look any different. And I am not sure that I have any of these answers. Like I, I feel like this is not the like positive promising note that we might have wanted to end on, but I am willing to think about and brainstorm ways because honestly, it has been a rough, very, very rough few years, and it's, it's. I think that a lot of us are maybe in a slump right now, um, where, where it's hard to know how to approach things. The, the personal cost has become too heavy, and there isn't enough support, especially if we're coming from a community like the explosive community, where almost everyone is a person of color. Um, almost everyone has to deal with that, that extra layer of, of having super racialized experiences and then immigrant experiences on top of that. Um, so many of our people have to deal with seeking asylum, have to deal with uh, student visas not being renewed, and they know they're going to be sent back home when it's all over. Uh, the Muslim ban has affected so many of our people because uh, it means that they're just suddenly there's suddenly an ocean separating them from their loved ones, um, even if they wanted to go back. There's just so many issues like this that feel like it takes super, super high level funding and organizing and resources that just aren't at our disposal. And all we can offer is discourse. And and discourse is great, but it only gets us so far. Even the type of discourse that focuses on the misogyny, that focuses on the racism, that focuses on the weird intersections of those things with the fact that we are criticizing communities for being misogynistic, for being homophobic, for being racist. We have a huge anti-Black problem in Muslim communities, and of course it transfers over into ex-Muslim communities as well. Um, just this type of stuff. We have the discourse, we have the stuff that we we can point to and we say, we know this is going to, this needs to get better, but it's hard to figure out how this is going to happen. And I feel that's why a lot of us maybe have, have regressed from the community side of it because we aren't seeing the results that we want and it's really disheartening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that was, very insightful and thoughtful. And I'm glad you shared what you shared because it's a continuing conversation. I mean, I mentioned early in this convention that I've been involved in this community now for 
21, shit, 21 years, uh, I got involved when I was a college student and then somehow have stuck here <laughs> and somehow now have a paid position at a nonprofit organization and, you know, get to be part of the discussion on several different levels that I started as a volunteer at the community level, um, working with campus groups and community groups and then volunteering with campus groups and then working at the Center for Inquiry and now working in American Atheists. And it's an ongoing conversation. We had a discussion room last night um, as part of the, uh, the social sessions and it was called, let's talk about atheism and race and stuff. And we ended up going pretty late into the night slash early in the morning uh, with a variety of people joining the conversation to talk about, you know, to look inside at our own community and not just say like, oh, what are we fighting against? But no, like, what have we had to deal with and how do we want things to get better? And how do we do things better? And what might we really need to think about overhauling in big ways? What are some of the challenges we face? Things like you've, each, each of you have brought up some of the toxicity in our community, some of the ways that we could be more inclusive that we've, you know, when we joined, we expected things to be a little different, but they, they weren't, you know, where, how do we think about how to focus our resources at different levels, at the local level, on the individual level, on the national organization level to build, you know, to help foster, I shouldn't just say build, cause it's not a one way direction. It always has to evolve, but to foster communities and community that is able to serve needs of our members and accomplish our goals. And yeah, there, there aren't simple answers and there are a lot of issues and it does, it can lead to burnout and disengagement and then re-engagement. Certainly over the last four years, you know, there've been new, <laughs> some new stresses in this last year too. And for some, it meant new opportunities and passion to get involved to make to make change in others. It was like, you know, I've been working on this and doing this and I need to focus on helping myself and, and taking care of myself too, uh, so that I can invest in things and and make this change happen too without burning myself out. So no, the honesty is much appreciated there. All of your perspectives are fantastic. So I wanna thank you all for joining, uh, for being so, personal and vulnerable and opening up to this uh, audience, to being part of this convention and for doing the work that you're doing in different spaces. Oh, I'll tear you now. <laughs> Not gonna cry on panel video, but I really thank you for being part of this and for uh, doing what you do. Um, and thanks to our audience too, for your great comments and questions and people sharing resources. A lot of the things you talked about, uh, your Twitter accounts and things like that. We can send an email out um, after the convention to the convention attendees with some links uh, to your different resources. And I'll also mention, since I have the benefit of having a position with an organization, that one of the things that I'm thinking we can do, uh, we've talked about doing this better. And I've, as you were talking, I was thinking about ways that we can do this is, uh, you know, doing a better job of sharing stories like yours to our people and to the media. Sometimes we share them, but we don't feel like people are listening. But considering some of the resources you've mentioned um, and the power of stories, I think that's something that we can prioritize better to get the word out to people and maybe invite you back for additional panels and presentations too, to continue this conversation. So thank you very much to each of you.